Okay, we're good to go. Great. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, we have an agenda today of about seven speakers who will speak to the new legislation that is being introduced by Representative Cam Buckner and Senator Ram Vili Vallam. And uh, each speaker will speak for a couple minutes and we'll have Q&A at the end. Uh, you'll see on the slides uh, to ask a question to reach out to Mandy via text. Um, and we'll have those questions start up at about 10.30 and try to wrap everything up at about 10.45. Uh, the webinar is being uh, recorded. It'll also be available by request about an hour or so after the event. And to start off um, the comments today, I'd like to introduce the chairman of the Illinois Senate Transportation Committee, Senator Ram Villivola. Senator. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and thank you everyone uh, for inviting me to participate in the work that you're doing to ensure that we move this issue forward. As was mentioned, my name is Ram Villivalam. I'm the state senator for the 8th district, which is the northwest side of Chicago and uh, northwest suburbs in Cook County. It's an honor for me to be here and, and be a part of this effort uh, to build on the work that's been done uh, by IDOT and other agencies and advocates to create a much more transparent and e equitable uh, transportation and infrastructure system in our state. There's two points I wanna hit on. One is, is the transparency piece, and two is how this impacts people's lives. Uh, as, as it relates to transparency, you know, in 2019, we passed an historic uh, Rebuild Illinois capital plan, uh, and it was a $33.2 billion a horizontal plan and, and, and more, more for the vertical side as well. And we did this because our uh, transportation infrastructure system was rated D minus by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, we needed to, to really overhaul our roads, bridges, and mass transit. And the promise that we made to taxpayers were was that we would deliver. We would we would uh, fund this, and we would deliver on these projects. And essentially, I think what we're asking today is, as IDOT does this work, as we you know work with IDOT and other agencies to do this work, uh, we want them to show their work. We want them to we want them to make sure we understand uh, how they're uh, prioritizing their projects, and so the simple way I can put it is the public deserves a more thorough opportunity to understand why projects are funded by IDOT and why they're included in the multi-year plan. Building this trust uh, in in the projects that are shown based on their merits um, will will ensure that the people, the public, the general public. Uh, believe that this is going to improve their safety, improve economic growth, and improve the environment. The second piece of this is how this impacts people's lives on a daily basis. Uh, I, I don't think it's a stretch for us to look at um, our state and our, and our country and say that economic stability and, and accruing wealth is high related, high, highly related to one's ability to access employment, education, healthcare, you know, all of the different services that someone needs via transportation. One statistic that I want to point out is of the 100 census tracts in the Chicago region with the longest commutes, 95 are majority Black or Latinx. There's no question that most of America's communities have de been developed so that housing is located a significant distance from jobs, stores, medical care, meaning that transportation needs to cover long distances in most des destinations are accessible only by uh, car. We need to rectify this inequity. Uh, if we're really going to uh, give communities of color, give folks from rural communities the best opportunity to provide for their families and contribute to their local economy. So to recap, why is this important? It's important because we need to ensure that people trust our government agencies in terms of what they're doing, what they're putting forth in the Rebuild Illinois plan to improve our, our roads, bridges, and mass transit. And that starts with making sure that IDOT shows their work and that we work with other agencies to do the same. And why is it important to people's lives in the state of Illinois? Well, there's, there's always conversation about people leaving the state. And I tell them two things. I said, one, we need to fund our higher education to make sure we continue to produce the best talent in the world. Two, we need a transportation and infrastructure system 
that allows people to access the services they need. That's why people come to Chicago, Cook County, the state of Illinois in the first place. And we need to go back to that and make sure we're investing in that and doing so in a transparent way. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And next up is Representative Cam Buckner, who is uh, the chair of the Illinois House General Assembly Black Caucus. Representative Buckner. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Senator. And thank you for everybody who has joined us here today. Um, this is a very, obviously a very important um, uh, topic. And the fact that we are talking about this in an intentional way gives me real hope that we can have some movement on it. Uh, over a prolonged period of time, we have seen very clearly that the negative, effect, negative health effects that result from inequities in our transportation system usually fall on the most vulnerable Illinoisans, those who can least afford it, uh, low income residents, minorities, children, people with disabilities, and our seniors. Uh, higher costs and longer commutes are a hallmark of these issues. We also know that substandard infrastructure in low income and minority communities has prevented people from using active transportation. It also has made walking and bicycling less safe for those folks in my community who rely on these modes to get around, leading to higher incidences of collisions involving uh, pedestrian, pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, there's some interconnectivity here that we need to talk about uh, with other inequities that Black that the Black Caucus has addressed in our transformative policy pillars. Low income and minority communities are more likely to be located near highways and other transportation facilities that produce, that produce, uh, that, sorry, that create locally reduced uh, air quality and, all, and to suffer from negative health effects such as asthma. Uh, we saw, we've seen how this has been ex exacerbated during this COVID crisis. Uh, these communities are also less likely to have convenient access to parks, healthcare, and healthy food. Many of the strategies that we as a state can take to increase active transportation, improve safety, improve air quality, and improve connectivity can improve equity if they are targeted in low income and minority communities. This is evident in how we determine where, when, and how to provide for basic mobility needs, assuming pedestrian and transit accessible community development. Interrelated and innovative strategies are suggested that we weave together um, for both the disadvantaged and those people who uh, could and will support a growing economy. In the process, pathways for the whole population will be envisioned. The return on investment for putting dollars, resources, uh, inclusion, and common sense behind transportation infrastructure development is unparalleled. Investing in our state's public transportation will be crucial in lifting Illinois out of the economic crisis caused by this virus. To say that public transit is a catalyst for job creation and economic growth is an understatement. For every $1 billion invested in public trans, 50,000 jobs are created and sustained across industries. And for every $1 invested in public transportation, it generates approximately $5 in economic returns across the entire society. Uh, beyond the construction and the manufacturing jobs that are created from transit-related maintenance projects, um, this is also integral to connecting job seekers to potential employers. As job locations become increasingly dispersed and transit services in central business districts and corridors are no longer adequate, uh, the spatial mismatch of jobs and residents for low income families has been a well-known problem that has not been dealt with effectively. Given land use patterns and community designs that suppress transit demand and the lack of capital and operating funding for transit properties. I represent communities like Washington Park, and Greater Grand Crossing, and South Shore who have fought for access to transportation for decades. I also represent downtown Chicago, the central business district where many of these residents travel to their jobs. There is a better way to achieve greater transportation outcomes and public accountability, and it's called performance-based planning. It's a commitment to using data to compare proposed infrastructure projects. HB 253 will do exactly that. We know that better infrastructure helps Illinois residents live better lives. Roads, bridges, trains, sidewalks, and bike lanes impact how people spend their time, their money, and where they raise their families. Ultimately, their access to opportunities are affected by this. We can do more to improve people's lives through transportation access and reliability by accounting for equity when making transportation, de transportation decisions. I wanna say thank you to the advocates, the allies, uh, my colleagues who have already voiced their support, and for all of you for being here today. We are excited about the possibility for Illinois to lead on this very important issue. Thank you. 
Thank you, Representative. Next up is Mary Tyler, the Transportation Analyst for the Illinois Economic Policy Institute, who's just conducted some very um, exciting research on the policy that's the core of this legislation. Mary. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yes, I am Mary Tyler. I'm with the Illinois Economic Policy Institute. We are a nonprofit research organization. Uh, we provide analyses on policies and projects that impact Illinois, um, and transportation is one of our primary areas of research. Um, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about a report that we just released um, called Improving Transportation Investments Through Performance-Based Programming. And you've already heard today about the importance of developing this process and some of the basics behind it, and our report goes into a lot of that. Um, but really, I want to focus today on uh, our analysis that we did of other states and the and the approach that they've taken to do this process and understand how that could be applied to Illinois. Uh, just a little bit of background. Every um, performance-based programming process is going to have kind of key components that you you want to make sure you're capturing and could be considered best practices uh, to consider. And so those are articulating your goals. Um, evaluating projects against those goals using different criteria, uh, tracking the performance of those projects, and then also communicating the process to the public. Uh, so there are many states across the country that have started to adopt a performance-based programming process when selecting project uh, transportation projects. Um, and so we focused on four specific ones. We looked at Virginia, um, and then also three that are right here in our in our region in the Midwest uh, area to understand just kind of what our neighbors are doing. And we were looking at Ohio, Minnesota, and Kentucky who have all adopted these processes. Uh, I think the biggest takeaway um, that I want to say here is that there are multiple approaches to accomplishing performance-based programming. You know, there, like I said, there, there uh, are standards that you want to make sure you're hitting, but you can accomplish them in different ways. And so I'm just going to touch on a few of the, the different approaches that we saw through these states and that our research found. Uh, looking at uh, each state, they apply the process to different funding program. So some of the states would apply it to federal programs, some to state programs, some to local. Uh, so these are all things that can be taken into account. They can also look at different projects that are eligible that are being considered under here. Some states looked at almost all projects, um, including uh, maintenance and those types of projects, but some are looking strictly at added capacity projects or more major, uh, you know, expansion projects, those types of things. Each state uh, took a different approach as to agencies that were eligible to submit projects. And so this could be coming across the board. It was pretty common to see a state DOT district would be submitting projects or MPOs or transit agencies. But some states also would take into account uh, like port authorities or other freight related agencies. Each state could uh, manage their or would manage their program slightly differently, whether that be the state DOT staff largely handling it, managing the whole process, or having an oversight committee that um, actually helps ultimately select the projects, uh, looking at looking at the scoring and the ranking and things like that. And uh, and then the last kind of item I want to touch on is that each state scores projects differently. So you know we talked about you have these goals. Um, and evaluating the projects, you're doing that based on criteria. And some of the most common that we saw across the board are safety, congestion, economic development. Those are all very common that you want to take into account and evaluate when selecting a transportation project. But there are a lot of others that could be considered too. And, you know, looking at accessibility to jobs, looking at equity, looking at environmental factors, a lot of these things that, that we've already heard today, the importance behind those. Uh, so I encourage everyone to look at our report. You're going to get a lot more detail uh, behind these programs, understanding what other states have done, understanding different approaches that Illinois could take as, uh, as it's developing uh, its own process. And uh, really, I just want to wrap up by saying, you know, transparency is important. The, the, the past few years, Illinois has taken a lot of steps to really improve the transportation system statewide to address a lot of the needs that we're seeing, looking at rebuild Illinois, looking at increased funding, uh, the constitutional amendment to protect those funds. And so this is really the important next step to ensure that that money is going to the most beneficial projects for the state. And uh, that concludes my presentation. I just want to say thanks for having me. Thank you, Mary. Uh, next up is Rochelle Jackson. She is the chair of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee 
of the North Lawndale Community Coordinating Council. Rochelle. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I just wanted to make my statement really quick. Um, since the inception of the NLCCC in 2015, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee focused on one of many things to improve access to public transportation. On top of the list was the return of the 157 Streeterville bus to be extended to the Pulaski Pink Line. In 2008, when the Ogden-Taylor route merged with the Streeterville route, the west end of Ogden from California to Pulaski was cut off from access to the Illinois Medical District in downtown leaving residents of North Lawndale that are west of California to use alternative routes to get to school, work, and medical appointments. The alternative routes meant people had to take two or three buses just to get to their destination, which usually was on Ogden in the medical district or downtown. I would love it if all of transportation and infrastructure entities would become boots on the ground and become more present in communities before they make life-changing decisions that affect black and brown communities mentally and physically, rather than looking at digital and satellite maps that determine what the government, whether federal, state, and local gives communities as opposed to what communities need. New and improved infrastructure is a must, given that infrastructure in underserved communities are not a priority surrounding transportation. Infrastructure at bus and train stops is decades old on most stops and needs to be addressed. In some places, sidewalks are crumbling or missing altogether. There are no mobility hubs in some of these communities to create walkability, bike riding, or other transportation that's not a car. Transportation in the city has never been fair. And whenever there's a budget cut, the black and brown communities are always the first priority to see where funds can be saved or for a lack of a better term, shift it to appease the more affluent neighborhoods. The long, this, the time is long overdue. For government to stop looking, overlooking our communities and create equitable change and stop the disparities that continue to create harm in our communities. That's pretty much my statement for today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, just a reminder for the reporters that are uh, participating, please, uh, when you send Mandy questions, to include your name and organization. Next up is myself. I'm Tom Katarik. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club of Chicago. The Commercial Club is one of the city's oldest civic organizations, started in 1877 with a mission to make Chicago the best place to live, work, and do business. And thanks to Chairman uh, Billy Valam and Representative Buckner for introducing this important legislation today because transportation is essential to business, jobs, and economic growth. And it's our transportation system and assets like O'Hare Airport that are one of the key reasons that we're able as a state to retain and attract major employers. And in 2019, when the state passed the largest capital bill in history, we had revenues that totaled up to $33 billion over six years just for transportation. It's that kind of level of investment that's really one of the very few tools that we have to create an environment for economic growth and help our city and state compete in a global economy. However, we lack a focused, goal-oriented plan to invest these dollars to drive economic growth and job creation. This legislation will help ensure the projects we choose to invest in will deliver results and that our public agencies like the Illinois Department of Transportation do so with accountability and transparency. This devastating pandemic has reminded us all of the importance of transparency and communication. It is more important now than ever to build trust and accountability with our public institutions. And this legislation will help businesses, our elected representatives and the public understand why we are building a particular bridge or highway or transit or multimodal project. With this legislation, the state will have a much stronger approach to drive investments to projects that have measurable impacts on economic growth climate change and equity. And so thanks again to Senator Billy Balam and Representative Buckner uh, for this legislation and your advocacy on behalf of transportation in our state. I'd like to hand it off to, I'd like to hand it off to Audrey, who is the transportation director for the Metropolitan Planning Council. Audrey. Hi, thanks Tom. Um, I'm Audrey Wenning, director of 
Transportation for the Metropolitan Planning Council, which is an 85 year old nonprofit, nonpartisan urban planning and policy organization that seeks to improve sustainability, prosperity, and equity in our state and region. As we embark upon this process, we need to remind ourselves what do people want out of the transportation system? They want access to jobs and services. They want to get places without risking death or injury. They want to have choices so they can do longer trips by car and train and shorter trips by bus, biking and walking. The way we've been investing has not been delivering what we need. For example, pedestrian deaths in Illinois are up nearly 50% over the past 10 years and transportation is the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. We can do better. Performance-based planning is a powerful tool that allows us to take into consideration multiple dimensions when we consider a transportation project, including traffic, traffic operations, safety, economic development, the environment, livability, and equity. The process is flexible. It recognizes that different areas of Illinois have different needs. The tool can and should be customized to our state and to the needs of different regions in our state. Criteria can be weighted differently based on different priorities. We need to institutionalize a process in, in Illinois that comprehensively evaluates how we spend our precious transportation dollars. We cannot forget that these investments are being made by using residents' taxes, and we must be delivering what the public wants and needs. Importantly, this approach has been shown to increase the level of innovation in solving transportation problems and getting the greatest benefits out of every public dollar. We believe our transportation agencies have the knowledge and the capability to do this and organizations like ours stand ready to assist in developing a process that works for our state. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. And our last speaker is Ruth Rosas, who is a resident of the West Side and she'll discuss her experience with transportation in her community. Ruth. Hi, um, living in Chicago means that Many streets I use are under IDOT jurisdiction. I haven't owned a car for the past 11 years, which means that I solely rely on public transit, bicycling and walking to get where I need to go. Uh, I have lived next to roads like Pulaski, Cermak, Ogden, Cicero, all which fall under IDOT jurisdiction. And there's a stark difference between walking and biking on these roads compared to other roads in Chicago. Uh, these differences, the noise, comfortableness, safety, have impacted my livability. Uh, and the livability of my neighborhood and at, and at times have severely impacted my mobility. I regularly bike all the way down Pulaski and Belmont from Little Village to Belmont Cragen next to diesel trucks and large vehicles across many neighborhoods to get to my job. Along the way, I see road construction, uh, upgrades being made on different roads, wondering why these improvements are being made on these streets, but not on the street that I was on. I want to see myself and my community reflected in these improvements, in these policies and practices by governing bodies. Racial equity, uh, environmental and health impacts need to be part of the conversation. And governing agencies, agencies should hear from the community on their needs and help communities understand why these improvements and investments are being prioritized. As a resident of the west side of Chicago, I know firsthand that improving the environment of a community directly affects the health and wellness of the people that live there, specifically black and brown residents. Our governing bodies need to make sure that they are keeping underserved communities front and center so that people feel comfortable walking, biking, and using public transit and driving on any street that they choose. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, we'll move on now to the question and answer portion of the program, and I'll hand it off to Mandy. All right, thanks everyone. Um, just as a reminder, uh, you could either text me at 773-640-1206 or email me at m-b-u-r-r-e-l-l-b-o-o-t-h, that's mburrellbooth at metroplanning.org. Um, I'm waiting on at least one text from someone I know, um, but uh, one question from Cole Henke of WCIA, how does a performance-based program account for less populated rural areas that need rural highways for, for, for farmers to transport their product? Will this new proposal prioritize more populated areas? And I would say maybe either, um, you know, 
TK or Audrey, if you want to start off and then and then open it up. Sure. Um, I'll just talk about the experience in other states. And so the answer is uh, no, it's not meant to, to benefit a population. Um, really what this, what this does is put in data-driven, transparent performance measures that are really tailored to the local geography uh, and that are formed with uh, input from those uh, residents that live there. So access to ag markets is incredibly important uh, for many parts of our state. And uh, with something like this, performance-based planning, you would prioritize that performance measure in that area. However, that, that performance measure would not be as important uh, to Cook County, for example, uh, where access to ag markets is important, but maybe not as important uh, as it might be in downstate. Similarly, performance measures like congestion, which are very important to uh, the urban core in the city of Chicago, uh, may not be as important to downstate, uh, and so, so weighted less. And again, the, the, the key here is to have a system uh, and a, a performance measures that are transparent so that we understand what is being weighted, what is being prioritized. And that's what we lack today. Okay. Um, this question is for the Senator, also from Cole of WCIA. You said you want IDOT to show their work. Uh, but wouldn't this take all decision-making power away from IDOT? No, I, I don't believe so. I think we, we've entrusted IDOT to implement this Rebuild Illinois plan. Uh, we, we know that they have amazing engineers on staff. Uh, we know that um, they have uh, people that uh, will take into account the different factors that we're asking them to consider, uh, be it environment or equity. Uh, we're simply saying, uh, you know, you, you can do the work. We want to support you in doing the work. Uh, we're asking for public engagement, more public engagement, and we're asking for them to, quote unquote, again, show the work and, and, and share that information with us. Uh, I think that is, uh, quite honestly, as Tom referenced, now more than ever, uh, important. We need transparency. Uh, I, I trust that they can do the work, and I know that they have, again, quality people working there. Uh, however, uh, as an elected official, and I think Representative Buckner would agree, is um, we were elected to uh, be accountable to our, our residents and our taxpayers, and uh, that means that we need to um, keep the trust that they've put in us to, as we, when we voted to, on the Rebuild Illinois, uh, but also engage them throughout this six-year process. Uh, to ensure that their thoughts and their ideas and, and what they feel is important in terms of which pr projects to uh, prioritize and what factors to include uh, are included. So uh, this is about collaboration. This is not about, uh, you know, us telling IDOT, you know, you need to do um, this or that or, or else. Th that's not the intent of this at all. Does anybody else want to respond to either of those before I move on? There's a few more questions. Okay. Um, from Greg Hines of Crane Chicago Business, um, a few questions. Uh, first, a simple one, are there specific bill numbers? Uh, number uh, two, what specific process is established? Walk me through who and how. And finally, how does this process insulate projects from political pressures? So bill, bill numbers, process, uh, who and how, and then um, you know, how does this process insulate projects? Yeah, so the, the bill number is HB 257, I believe. Um, I think I've got that right, uh, HB 257. And uh, just from a, from a process standpoint, I don't know, uh, uh, TK, if you want to jump in here and walk through this with me, but you know, this is really based on, uh, obviously, that's what we've seen around the country. I, I, I want to take a step back a little bit to, and highlight that, that um, IDOT has done a um, pretty job on some of the past, right? And, and really what, what we're attempting to do uh, is to create a, a streamlined uh, process, uh, a codified process across the board that, that puts us in a more advantageous position as a state. Um, and th this is not, you know, calling somebody to task for um, maybe this, this is wanting to build on, on the, success, the successes 
of uh, uh, Representative Buckner, we're having a hard, hard time with your audio. Could you could you hold one second? I can jump in and I'll ask for an assist. Uh, that would be great. And then maybe we can, that would be great. Maybe then we can get uh, Representative Buckner back on with, um, without the, without the video and maybe just the audio could work, but go ahead, Tom. Sure. Uh, I'll just sort of uh, set the table to, to piggyback off of something that uh, the Senator Representative said. You know, IDOT's made some progress here and there are doing some things that are very positive and really have the principles of performance-based planning and programming uh, at their core. Uh, IDOT reformed their planning program, uh, which is, you know, a little bit of federal, a lot of federal and some state money uh, into a program that, you know, previously 10 years ago was fairly opaque. Uh, projects were selected, wasn't very sure about what projects were selected uh, or how, and now they have an accessible um, call for projects with the criteria established and documented. Uh, and there's a competition where uh, everyone knows uh, what they are going to uh, find themselves into. Uh, similarly, uh, a new program for transportation enhancements, uh, bike, pedestrian enhancements to roads like Ruth brought up, uh, like Pulaski and other treatments that would make it more livable and accessible uh, by the General Assembly, uh, by law, uh, that passed uh, not very long ago, IDOT will have to uh, have an established performance-based programming and planning system uh, with a call for projects for you know, over $50 million uh, a year. Uh, that's great progress, but really we're still talking about billions of dollars that are included in the multi-year plan. IDOT lists the projects that they're gonna invest in with very little information to understand why are we choosing those projects to build in. There's certainly a story about why they were chosen. I think as Senator, uh, Vili Valam said, first, show your work. Let's talk about what some of the decision-making process was. Uh, but really, let's, let's, let's open up those books and, and let's be transparent and accountable. If we feel that a project was meant to address economic development, did it. Uh, let's quantify that and let's make sure that we're trying to do things that improve safety uh, by measuring it and then seeing if we're successful and then refining it over time. Uh, so this legislation really sets up the requirement uh, that IDOT do that, uh, that they set those performance measures, that they communicate them to the public, and that they craft them with input from the public, context sensitive, uh, really down to the geography uh, that they're going to be applied to. And and uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to just add to that. First, let me just echo Tom's, Tom's uh, uh, initial comments. Uh, I think IDOT has done some good work here. The Sec Secretary Osman, uh, I would say has a near impossible job. He, he has to oversee this massive program um, that we absolutely need to implement to improve our roads, bridges, and mass transit, uh, not only for the safety of our residents, uh, but also to address systemic inequities and to ensure that we're, again, getting people back to the state of Illinois. Uh, and so it, it is a tough job. And let me just say, as an aside, uh, he needs, um, the department needs more staff to, to be able to do it. Um, and, I, and I fully support that. I, I will also add, you know, I, th I believe it's um, House Bill 253 uh, in, the, in the House. And, uh, you know, uh, Representative Buckner is a sponsor there. And I uh, look forward to uh, introducing uh, the Senate version uh, here shortly in the next week. Uh, and I look forward to working uh, with uh, both of our uh, uh, colleagues, both in the House and the Senate and the administration uh, to, to move this forward. Uh, and, and to answer the last question that, that Greg asked, uh, no, I don't believe this um, should be subject to political pressure uh, in, in the sense that, uh, quite honestly, the, the questions that I get about the multi-year plan are, are from constituents, are from stakeholders, and they're from legislators. You know, I, I have a colleague who uh, has been, her district has, uh, you know, a project in her district has been uh, the subject of conversation for 22 years. And she asks me, you know, being chair of the transportation committee, she asked me, 
well, what's and, and IDOT, what's going on? Like I, my constituents keep asking me about this project, you know, and it's always put in the out year of the multi-year plan, you know, typically. And so look, you know, people think that legislators are pressing their thumb on the scale for a project or that they want, you know, certain things to happen and, and it's it's their purview and whatnot. Uh, number one, their purview will still be heard. Number two, uh, quite honestly, again, they're, they're the ones that are asking the questions about when these projects are going to happen. So, you know, I, I just don't uh, buy that um, that argument. And, and I'll also say this, this has been a, uh, and credit, the credit goes to the people on this call. This has been a, I would say eight month or longer education process, you know, for, with our colleagues. And we, we've had briefings, we've had hearings, uh, and, and we went over this information and we talked about the importance of transparency, which no one disagrees with uh, in, in the General Assembly. We've talked about the importance of equity uh, and uh, and so now is the time to act. Now is the time to act. We've done the briefings. We've done the hearings. Let's go. You know. And so I think that's where we're at. Uh, Representative Buckner, since we lost you, did you want to add anything on that round of questions? Perhaps on the audio only, or I think his cat was typing on the the keyboard. <laughs> Oh, Zoom. Um, all right, we'll, we'll have one more question. This one from Mike Davidson. Um, tell us how performance-based decision-making uh, will help our state's fiscal outlook. Sure, I'll, I'll just add again from some of the research. This is again a best practice, um, you know, uh, that is uh, encouraged by US Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration. So I'll bring up a couple points. Uh, North Carolina went through this process some years ago and, and before they were just finishing 25% of the projects that they promised in any given year. And after bringing a, again, a rigorous performance-based programming model, uh, they found that they were finishing way more projects. Uh, so you're gonna get more work and you're gonna get it done quicker. Uh, secondly, the, the federal government and their competitive grant programs are now weighting criteria like racial equity, impacts of transportation to climate change, and using those measures to uh, select projects for, for large investment. Uh, USDOT just came out a few weeks ago, or last week, uh, with a new grant for almost a billion dollars. Uh, so if we know what our project's impacts are, we're already ahead of the game. Uh, so more discipline, uh, more projects, uh, more competitive grants uh, with, the, with the US Department of Transportation, and again, building the trust and accountability so that we can build from that to tell the public why we may need to invest uh, and why we are investing. Again, transportation is, is, in, is incredibly important to our state's long-term economic health. We need to make sure that everybody understands what we're using those funds to do and, and, and what goals they're gonna achieve. All right, I don't see any further questions in my email or text. Um, if you are a reporter and you do have additional questions, uh, you can feel free to email me, uh, you know, following the news conference, happy to connect you with anyone um, for a further interview and uh, feel free to text me or call me 773-640-1206. Um, and with that, um, we'll just wrap up here. Senator, if you want to, Senator Representative, to close. Well, let me just say thank you again to all of you for helping to organize this and for your efforts uh, over the years to get us to this point. Um, we are at a crossroads. Uh, we can choose uh, transparency and equity, uh, or uh, we can continue to do what we have been doing. I think uh, it's time for the change. I'm just you know, honored to be a part of this effort. I look forward to working on it, this legislation, uh, this session, and having robust conversations with all of the stakeholders and, and IDOT as well. And I'm just, you know, I'm very thankful that I have a, a counterpart, Representative Buckner in the House, who uh, will carry the mantle as well and, and uh, look forward to uh, getting this done. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the morning and a good good day. Thank you.